In this video, we're going to look at materials, at the spatial PBR material that Godot 3 onwards ships with. And we're going to look in particular at the most important parameters, so albedo, metallic, roughness, and the more advanced ones which will come in a future video on the topic. I'm not going to provide a base project here. I invite you to head to cc0textures.com where you can find high quality textures that are in the public domain so you can pick any material that you'd like. I invite you to use this one because it's very interesting in that you not only have the textures but you have a preview of how the material is supposed to look like. And the way you set up materials in 3D in the editor like that is you're going to try to make them match either a photograph that you use as a reference to reproduce a real material, or in this case, because the artist has kindly provided us with a really nice render, you can use that as a reference to set the parameters in Godot, because depending on the engine, the exact values that you are going to use are going to be different. They don't scale exactly the same way. For example, you can download the 2K version of a set of textures, and going back to Godot, you will be met with a zip file that contains a texture with the name underscore the version, the variant of the materials texture that you're going to plug into the material in Godot. So you have color, often color, normal map roughness, the base ones, and sometimes you will have ambient occlusion, displacement, or metallic. So let's create a new scene where we're going to set up our meshes. I'm going to press Control-1 to have only one view in the viewport, a single viewport. We're going to click to create a 3D scene here. Now we want to add a plane and a sphere to test our material. So press Control-A to add a new mesh instance. And with mesh instance, you can create basic meshes in Godot. Head to the inspector on the right, click the slot on mesh, and you want to go down to new plane mesh. We're going to scale it up because it's a bit small by default. So press R to toggle the scale tool and click the square uh, that's green that's going to scale the X and Z axes. Then we want to go back to the spatial node and add another mesh instance. We're going to create a sphere this time, so go to the bottom of the list to sphere mesh. And we're going to move it up so it sits on top of the plane. W to get the move tool and control click to snap and move one of the axes. So you click on the arrow here and control click to move it up. There you go. So we have our two meshes. Let's rename them to plane and sphere to keep things organized and we can get started with the materials. So let's click on the plane to select it and you want to unfold the material category and click on the slot empty to create a new spatial material. So shader material is one that you will code by yourself from scratch pretty much and spatial material when you create it and click on the material you will be met with a long list of parameters and these are all the BSDF properties, all the properties provided by Pixar's BSDF shader. It's a very complete type of material that was designed by Disney Pixar and that is used in some 3D programs including Godot. We will ignore the flags, vertex, colors and parameters for now. We're going to focus on what makes our material look like something nice. In order to proceed from there, you should have some textures somewhere in your project. Download it from cc0textures.com and put in there. Note that I've downsized mine, so they might look a little blurry at times, but this is so they import and re-import much faster for the video. I'm going to work with uh, the ground material here that I downloaded, one with leaves. We're going to unfold the albedo category and albedo represents the color of the material. And so you want to drag and drop the color texture into the texture slot here. In the previous generation of game engines and rendering algorithms, you had a texture called diffuse and diffuse would represent the color 
the material emits if it was lit by pure white light. But the models, the lighting model at the time was much simpler. So now it's called albedo and it doesn't represent exactly the same thing. The albedo is going to interact with the other parameters of the material to return the final color. If we go look at the texture itself, it doesn't have much light information, it looks very flat. And in the past, you might have used a bit of shade inside the diffuse texture to fake that lighting, but not anymore. So we have our base color here from that. And notice one thing, it's that the texture is not blue, but this, the ground looks blue. And that's one thing with when you are working with PBR, the environment, the procedural sky that you have by default in Godot is going to affect every object in the scene and every material. We're going to add a new light, just a d directional light to represent the sun so that we can see how our material looks a little better. So select the spatial node, press Control A, and you're going to search for directional light. Now by default it points to the right, let's move it up a little bit and we are going to rotate it. So press the E key and rotate the nodes so that it points down and you can see that all of a sudden our ground looks a lot better. All right, so let's select the plane again and go into the material. Now to make it easier to edit the material and to edit while we select objects on the scene, we're going to go to the little wrench uh, icon in the top right of the inspector and go save our material as. I'm going to call this one ground. I'll save it at the root. And that way we can Anytime I can fold my textures, double click ground the file here to open it in the inspector and it will still update in the viewport. The next parameter we want to look at is metallic. Metallic is going to define how much light the material reflects. Every material in the real world reflects some amount of light. Now, when you crank up that value, it's called metallic because the object is going to work a bit more like a mirror. So note that metallic and roughness interact with one another. So if I lower roughness to zero, the object is going to reflect a lot of light and will essentially act like a mirror. It's not going to work for our grounds, for our leaves, because leaves don't work that way. Leaves will have a low metallic value. The specular one, most of the time you don't want to touch it. It's a bit technical. You, you would offset it to achieve special effects. And that's about it for now. We can leave the metallic value pretty low and increase the roughness in the case of our leaves. The roughness represents the amount of details and nuts and crannies at a microscopic level that are on the object. So when a surface is very rough, it will tend to diffuse light, so you won't have a clear specular light, you won't have a clear highlight on the mesh. Something like leaves and dirt, or for example, if you take rocks, they tend to be pretty rough materials, and a polished metal or a mirror, for example, will be not rough at all, so you would take the value down a lot. Now you can see we have texture slots in metallic and roughness and they allow us to control the material's roughness to weigh this value because right now it's applied to the entire plane making it look very flat but if I take the roughness texture and drop it into the slot and increase the roughness now it's not as uniform anymore. So you will see in a moment th this makes some parts more reflective than others. Now at this point it doesn't look outstanding, but this is because you need all the textures to really define the material and get the wanted result. So we have to add the normal map and the displacement map as well for the material to look good. The emission we're going to skip right now, it's how much light the object emits. So you can turn an object in a static light, if you want, by turning emission on, which we don't want for our, our ground. And we'll see in the future that this only works if you are using global illumination. It's not going to cast shadows, for example. Now, normal map 
is going to add details. It's going to fake the volume of the object. So let's enable it. And you need a texture for the normal map to work. So this texture contains data that represents the volume of the surface. So how different parts of the material are oriented in space. One thing I've noticed from a CC0 texture is that you need to use a negative scale to get the right direction for the normal map. By default, the shade will be opposite from what you'd like. So you can toggle the normal map on and off to see how it starts to give you some bumps on the object. And you can change the light angle to see the effect a little more clearly. Now, I'm going to set the scale to be higher than that, minus two, to accentuate the effect. And you can see how it gives us a lot of bumps and small details on the object. I'm going to do one thing because you can see the texture is a little blurry maybe on your screen. It definitely is on mine. I'm going to open the material and go down to the UV category. And UV represents how many times you're going to put the texture on the mesh. Uh, if you, you've seen taxidermy or you, you've seen pelts taken from animals, UV is the same idea with 3D meshes. You take the mesh and you unwrap it, you unfold it on a plane, and this allows the 3D program to map your texture onto the surface. For a plane, it's a square. It's going to take the entire texture and map it on the plane, but obviously on a sphere or a character, it's quite different. You can't do that. Now we're going to scale our UVs just on the X and Y axis to make our texture tall into the object and that way we don't have the lack of details we had before and the texture already looks more convincing should i say the material rather after the normal map for this material we have a displacement texture so we're going to move on to that i'll skim over rim and clear coat uh, rim is going to simulate clothing especially surfaces that are velvety like silk for example going to create some backlight on the object. Uh, we can enable it if you want to see that. So it's very strong on this one by default. But if I lower the rim effect, you can see how it creates some backlight on the ground. And you can use it to make a character pop from the background to fake some light coming from behind the character from all angles. Then clear coat. Uh, clear coat is a property that you use when there are two layers in your material. I invite you to read the little tooltip here. But for example, on cars, you might have the paint and you have a layer of transparent material on top of that that's going to create a second specular reflection on the object. So you want to use clear coat to get that secondary specular light. Anisotropy is then a parameter you use with metal. It's going to lengthen the shape of the specular highlight, depending on how you use the property, but you use it often on brushed metals, for example, to get the highlights to look like how they look in the real world. Ambient occlusion, we'll see that in a second. It's going to darken the cavities in the object, but we need a texture to make it work. And then depth is quite interesting. This is a property that allows you to fake geometry on the object. So it's a bit like the normal map, except it's going to give more depth to your object. And you have displacement maps that you can use in the textures from CC0 texture. So let's drag and drop it into the texture slot here you will see the pixels pop down pretty suddenly. Now, if you move the camera around, it's going to look all mushy. I don't know why this scale value works this way. You can consider it like a, a small bug or UX thing to tweak because it's way too strong by default. Now, you can activate the deep parallax to soften the effect. And also, this is probably a little more performance intensive. It's going to sample the texture more times to apply the effect on screen because this is a pixel based effect while faking depth on the object. So note that uh, all these properties like using the depth, for example, has a small performance cost, right? But if I disable it and enable it again, you can see how it gives a bit of depth to our material. So I'll zoom in to show you how it works. Now, again, you want to use a negative scale often 
with the textures from CC0 Texture, you can see that right now we have gaps where we have the leaves and it looks very weird. So let's use minus 0.05 to have the leaves bump up. This makes our ground a little more believable. You can see that as we move the camera, the leaves feel in 3D, although they really are in 2D. So as you can see with this effect, the more parallel the camera gets to the surface, the less believable, like it starts to break a little bit. So you use it in complement to the geometry of a terrain, for example, to emphasize the bumpiness of the ground, but you want to measure, like to use this effect sparingly. You don't want the scale value to be too, too strong. Now we've seen the basic parameters on materials. I just want to show you quickly something we'll talk about in the next video, but how lighting and the environment are very important for how the materials look. So first, when you select a light, you have to tell Godot that you want it to cast shadows because shadows are performance intensive in games. You don't want all the lights to cast shadows. So I'm going to enable the shadow on my sun and already the scene looks a bit more believable with the sphere sitting on the floor. Then all 3D scenes use an environment resource that tells Godot what are the properties of the sky, what the objects should reflect or not. So you have to enable lots of these processing effects for the objects to look as believable as they can, or you can tweak these settings to trade performances for realism on your objects. Now I've prepared some metal to apply to the sphere and if I drag and drop it here you'll see something strange happens. It's very dark at the bottom and the reason for that is that right now it's not reflecting the ground. Instead it's reflecting my sky so I could hide the plane and the metal would not change at all. It's not reflecting the leaves under it. And this is controlled by the environment. And by default, Godot creates a default underscore environment resource that is going to apply to all the scenes where you did not override this environment because you want to change the sky and the environment that your objects will reflect, for example, per level in the game. So let's double click on that resource and I'm going to go to SS Reflections, Screen Space Reflections and enable them. And from there you will see that now my metal looks quite different. It reflects the ground. So this is just to tell you that if you're just watching this one and getting started and you get some fishy results, this is because you have to not only prepare good materials but you also have to create a good environment and the modeling and the textures, everything works together to create the game's final look and result. But that said, I want to thank you kindly, kindly for watching. Be creative, have fun, and see you in the next one to talk about the environment in Godot.